time on the hit list, eight chart-topping acts who proudly purvey their own brand of pop. After spending her teenage years in the shadow of kid sister Danny, Kylie Minogue shot into the limelight as motor mechanic Charlene Mitchell in Neighbours, opposite real-life partner Jason Donovan. Upon wowing the audience at a football club benefit concert with her version of Little Eva's Locomotion, she was signed up with Mushroom Records and sent to the UK to work with hit churners Stock Aitken and Waterman. Twenty UK top tens later, her level of celebrity and list of achievements have left Danny and Jason for dead. She's won Grammys, Brits and Arias, collaborated with a who's who of producers and performers, played sell-out shows at Wembley Arena, launched her own line of lingerie, concocted her own cologne and survived breast cancer. Finally, in 2009, at the age of 40, she was ready for the next challenge of making as big a name for herself in the US as she has everywhere else. I don't have the audience here that I have in other parts of the world. Um, but the audience that I do have are fiercely loyal and they've been so damn patient that it's, you know, it's the least that I can do is <laughs> to finally come. The biggest success she'd enjoyed stateside came in 2002 with the US release of her album Fever, which debuted at number three off the back of its insanely catchy dance single, Can't Get You Out of My Head, which Rolling Stone magazine lauded as the most omnipresent dance track of the new century. However, Kylie's ridiculously busy schedule, compounded with her battle with cancer, kept her from capitalising on that popularity for another seven years. I decided to finally <laughs> bring my shows here uh, because I've wanted to for ages, I mean, for the longest time, and it just never was uh, feasible to do it. And I was tired of hearing myself say that, let alone answering other people's questions, saying, why don't you ever come to the States? With more than two decades worth of hits to draw from, she could afford to be a bit flexible with her playlist. Recently, I've been just playing it by ear and um, if the audience is absolutely crying for them, I'll do locomotion and I should be so lucky. And they go off like the proverbial frog in a sock. <laughs> so they're a lot of fun to do. Not that she's just sitting back and dining out on her impressive back catalogue. Since the release of her appropriately titled 10th album, X, she hasn't let the fact that she's been out on tour get in the way of working on new material. So far I've just been in the studio with, um, with friends, well, people who have become friends through, through work and just writing songs and having fun and doing it just to, just to do it, I'm sure. Um, a lot of artists say that, where you just you just want to go in and just make music just to make music. And if something comes out of that, that's great. But I will be concentrating more um, throughout this year, recording. I'd love to have a little little studio in the back of the tour bus. That's, that's probably where it will happen. No doubt Kylie Minogue's incredible success has served as a great source of inspiration to her fellow countryman Sam Sparrow, whose prodigious musical talent was discovered at the age of 10, but he did have a head start. I'm the fifth generation in my family that's a musician, so there's a lot of musicians in my family. and it's um, it, it, Growing up actually it was quite intimidating because everyone was always you know, so well trained and I never wanted to do like the traditional kind of music school route. So I was always just kind of working on stuff with keyboards and drum machines and stuff like that. Um, because my grandfather's a you know jazz musician, my father's a blues guitarist and and all that. But there was always music in the house and it was great growing up with lots of musicians around. In 2007, his single Black and Gold rose to number two on the UK charts, neatly paving the way for his self-titled debut album, which went to number four and threw the openly gay multi-instrumentalist into the spotlight. A reluctant pop star because I don't really, f I don't know, I don't feel like a pop star. I think, you know, I'm quite an opinionated you know, kind of punk mentality kind of a person, you know, I'm really quite, I like to do things for myself. 
He took the same attitude to his sold-out live shows. I'm pretty spontaneous on stage, so the shows are never the same. Sometimes I'll jump into the crowd, sometimes I won't, sometimes I forget the words and make up new ones. <laughs> but it's, all, it's always very festive, I think. I like to describe it as like somewhere between a Las Vegas gospel church and a rave. <laughs> But Sam Sparrow fans in a hurry to get their hands on a follow-up to the first album may be facing a wait. Always working on music, like tracks and beats and stuff, just kind of throwing chords around and playing around with sounds. But when I write lyrics, I only write if I've got something actually on my mind, like something is bugging me or something um, is just, you know, pressing me on my, in my head. So I don't write very often. I go through patches where I, like, write ten songs and in a couple of weeks and then not write anything for six months or something. Right now I'm in the not writing any songs phase, I think. When Jessica Simpson hit the big time, she employed her younger sister Ashley as a backup dancer. Pretty soon the race was on to match her older sibling's success. By 2004, she had her own reality TV show, which helped boost sales of her debut album, Autobiography. Its first single, Pieces of Me, ended up being a big hit and won her a Teen Choice Award for Song of the Summer. But while some critics and columnists were trying to pit the sisters from Waco against one another, Ashley was adamant that they weren't rivals. Jessica and I are not competitive, but definitely, uh, you know, there are people that you can have a competitive streak with. Jessica and I don't have that because we're sisters. we got to be there for each other. She became only too aware of that in late 2004, in the wake of the infamous Saturday Night Live debacle, when she was caught out lip-syncing. That crushing gaffe made the news headlines and threatened to derail her fledgling career. It was followed up by another major cringe moment when her halftime performance at the Orange Bowl in Florida was met with boos from the 72,000 strong crowd. Incredibly, she quickly bounced back and ploughed all the residual embarrassment into her songwriting. I do actually. Um, I have a song called Beautifully Broken, and that's about my experience with um, SNL and whatnot. And it's a song about how everybody's kind of beautifully broken and we all have our highs and lows and you know kind of without that what do you have and where do you go and it's okay to fall on your face and it's a song about picking yourself up and continuing part of that process involved keeping her hand in as an actress and while working on her second album she took on a supporting role in the independent movie undiscovered um, they came to me actually, Lionsgate, and they said they really wanted me to do this film, and my dad uh, was going to be a part of it. And um, I read the script, and I liked it from the beginning, and I was just like hoping that my schedule, because I was, you know, crazy busy with music and whatnot, was going to allow me to be able to do this film. And um, I, I got the opportunity to do it. Although she didn't win rave reviews for her acting performance, her album, I Am Me, debuted at the top of the charts and gave her the opportunity to return to Saturday Night Live and right past wrongs. Since then, there's been no stopping her. In 2006, she signed on to play Roxy Hart in the London production of Chicago. Doing theatre has been extremely humbling because it's not about you're not a celebrity when you come here. Everybody's equal and you're all here doing the same place. So everybody has to work together. So this has been amazing. But as far as tabloids and, and whatnot go, I really try to keep my head out of them and not read the stories or, or anything like that because they're never really true. One reviewer declared her performance dazzling and near flawless. Then she was off to work on her third album, before getting married to Fallout Boy's Pete Wentz and giving birth to their son, Bronx Mowgli. Born and raised in Mechanicsville, Virginia, Jason Mraz has been on the up and up since the release of his debut album, Waiting for My Rocket to Come. Although the album only got as far as number 55 on the Billboard Hot 200 in 2002, its lead single, The Remedy, made it into the top 20. Three years later, his second album, Mr. A to Z, went all the way to number five and earned producer Steve Lillywhite a Grammy nomination for Producer of the Year. 
The album featured Jason performing an opera solo on a track called Mr. Curiosity, as well as a song optimistically entitled Life is Wonderful that was used to promote a campaign to raise money for music education. To me, it is a song that I'm hoping to draw attention to how life is wonderful and about how every detail in life, the good and the bad, equal life, equal, the, equal every blessed moment there is. And, um, and um, my good friends at Hilton, we all decided we'd put the song into the commercial. And I think it really works well with the Hilton Harmony piano um, because the, uh, the song says life goes full circle and the piano is about to take a full circle trip around the country and raise money for music education. After two years touring to promote Mr. A to Z, he shut himself away to work on his third album. For me to make this album, I really did have to withdraw from the music industry because I didn't want to write songs where I was affected by the industry, by charts, by sales, by, um, you know, just, just the industry in general can, can be a big distraction. We Sing, We Dance, We Steal Things debuted at number three on the Billboard charts and its lead single, I'm Yours, went to number one on AAA radio charts in the US. But despite scoring his biggest commercial success to date, the vegan of Czech descent had never aimed for stardom. I've never put my music out there with any expectation. I've never, I never imagined I would be on a chart or even doing any interviews. You know, I just, I was a coffee shop songwriter and I still am, you know, and I, I was always hoping to connect with people one-on-one -on -one in an intimate setting. Although he may not have set out to find success, success certainly found him. In 2009, at the age of 32, Jason was awarded the incredible honor of being inducted into the U.S. Songwriters Hall of Fame. Jake Shears, Baby Daddy, Animatronic, Del Marquis and Patty Boom formed the Scissor Sisters in New York in 2001. But it was after they signed a UK record deal in 2004 that things really took off. Their eponymous debut album spawned five hit singles. Comfortably Numb, Take Your Mama, Mary, Laura and Filthy Gorgeous. It was the UK's biggest selling album that year and went on to sell more than 2.5 million copies in Britain alone. After playing to sell out crowds and winning a whole host of awards, they turned their attention to their follow-up album and found themselves slightly overwhelmed by the suddenly stifling weight of expectation, not helped by months spent on the road. For so long, for months and months and months, I all I, all I could do was read books or watch movies, listen to music. Um, I didn't feel like I had anything to give. I felt absolutely like, like when you take two people take a towel and just wring it until there's nothing left. Um, I felt like that towel, <laughs> and um, and it um, it took a while for me to to soak things up and to feel like I had something to to give again. However, with inspiration flowing in from James Bond themes, early disco funk and rare groove, Fleetwood Mac, Dr. John, Bluegrass, Billy Joel and Goldfrapp, they ended up being spoilt for choice. There are a lot of different options. I mean, I think we, we opened up so many doors, it was really, it, there were definite moments of just like not knowing, um, you know, what it is necessarily we wanted to do. But I think that the, uh, our, our best songs and, and the stuff that really works that we do is the stuff that just comes in a moment or something that comes very naturally and, and, and not even the stuff that comes when you don't really think about it. Um, that always turns out to be what I think is as the best stuff. The resulting album, Tada, was released in September 2006 and featured the lead single, I Don't Feel Like Dancing, with Elton John on the piano. Well, that, that song is a really honest reflection of how we felt at the time. We were having a really, really hard time writing a dance song. We had, we had all of the earthy, singer songwritery, ballady, mid-tempo songs, and what we were under pressure to write were the fun party songs that people have come to know and love us for. It immediately became their biggest hit to date. And by New Year's Eve, bass player and lyricist Baby Daddy 
was feeling pretty pleased with the way his year had gone. It's been a great year for us, yeah. We yeah. finally got the damn thing on shelves. Done, on shelves, selling, people yeah. loving it. Had a big hit single. Um, that's probably the best thing. Yeah, I mean, we had never had, I think, uh, we were in the top five before, but a number one single in yeah. multiple countries, and we had never had a number one single. After finishing their world tour, the band decided to take some time off before getting back into the studio and recording their third album, with celebrated British producer Stuart Price at the helm. While countless artists constantly recreate themselves, it's hard to imagine a gulf greater than the one that exists between Katy Perry's first and second albums. At the age of 15, when she still went by the name of Katy Hudson, the daughter of two pastors released a collection of gospel songs on the Christian rock label Red Hill. Eight years later, she was posing in publicity shots with knives and turning her mother's hair on end with a song called You're So Gay. And if her goal was to raise eyebrows and turn heads, she knew she'd succeeded when the veteran queen of pot stirring sat up and took notice. Madonna was so enamoured with the 23-year-old's unique style and chutzpah that she talked her up on radio shows in Arizona. I think I, I, I reached out for my inhaler. Most definitely. When I heard that, I was like, oh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So most definitely amazing for Madonna to know somebody's first and last name. What? Madonna, what are you thinking? The buzz building around the release of her 2008 album, One of the Boys, helped send its lead single, I Kissed a Girl, to the top of the Billboard chart, making it the 1,000th number one in the rock era. Like You're So Gay, the song courted plenty of controversy, both from religious groups and gay campaigners. But for Katie, the message was simple. Um, actually, it's kind of one of those things where like, you open up a magazine and you look to your significant other and you're like, I'm not going to lie, if a Scarlett Johansson walked into the room and she wanted to kiss me, I might let her. I hope you're OK with that. It's one of those, like, that's my one. And it talks about like just like the uh, magical beauty of a woman and how like special that is and how we can pretty much do anything. <laughs> we are the dominant species. Having said that, she had to admit she hadn't kissed a girl herself. I haven't. I'm saving myself for Miley Cyrus. Despite the controversy over the song, many critics agreed that it was irresistibly catchy and the perfect breakthrough. Meanwhile, Katie was relishing being labelled as the next big thing. It gives me the opportunity to show off, and I'm excited because, you know, when somebody's like, let's see, can you sing, can you play? I'm like, yeah, that's me, I can sing, I play. I, I, I don't know, I, I'm glad I have the opportunity to just, like, step up to bat and hopefully hit a home run. On the 24th of May, 2006, Taylor Hicks won out over fellow finalist Catherine McPhee in the fifth series of American Idol. At the age of 29, the Silver Fox from Birmingham, Alabama, was the oldest contestant ever to be declared the winner in the most watched talent quest on television. When the announcement came, it took all of his willpower to stay on his feet. I, I was just telling myself when, when Ryan and Catherine, I was just, don't fall to the floor. Don't, don't let your knees buckle and I'm living the American dream. This is the American dream and it's come true for me and, you know, believe in your dreams and I want to thank all the people for voting for me because, you know, this is, this is my dream and it's come true. But it certainly hadn't come true overnight. After buying his first harmonica from a flea market at the age of 16, he started playing the blues and at 18 he taught himself to play guitar and wrote his first song. By the time Idol came around in 2006, he'd already released two albums. But while he may have been used to playing in small clubs, nothing had prepared him for the buzz of arenas. The echo of the arena, you know, I, as a performer and, you know, you never get that experience because, you, you know, you work your way up from, from performing in little small venues and small bars and, you know, now I'm going to have to get to hear the echo, and it's a dream come true. 
While on the show, he formed a loyal following which he dubbed the Soul Patrol, who flocked to the record stores to buy his self-titled major label debut. Unfortunately, the album failed to generate enough sales to impress Arista, and in 2008, he was dropped. While some critics predicted that would be the end of Taylor Hicks, he was back just one year later with a new album. Instead of signing with another record company, he decided to release The Distance through his own company, Modern Womp Records. After having to rush out with his post-idol release in six weeks, he was relishing his newfound freedom. I think the key f for this particular project was time. Uh, I had the time to create the songs, time to record the music, time to really think about the producers that I wanted to work with, you know, the, the writers I wanted to work with. He must have been doing something right because in May 2009, Forbes magazine put him at number 10 on the American Idol's top earners list. No doubt his bank balance was also boosted by his role as the Teen Angel in the national Broadway tour of the musical Grease. For the boy from Alabama who believes in the American dream, it was the perfect part. American as it gets, uh, and it's, the storyline is, you know, is very genuine and it's, it's a very, uh, the storyline is, it's fun for all ages. I think, you know, there's so many people that's, that have, that are familiar with Greece and it's such an American show and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's fun, it's, it's entertaining as far as from a song, song aspect too, because the songs are timeless. And that's kind of why I gravitated toward the role is because I knew that the, song, the songs were timeless. You know, people are still singing the song after all this time. Clay Aiken became the first non-winner of American Idol to go on to release a successful album. After leaving the second series as runner-up to Ruben Studdard, his debut Measure of a Man went straight to the top of the Billboard charts, outperforming any other solo debut of the previous 10 years, and scoring the highest first week sales of any other Idol contestant. His geek to chic transformation had made him a national favourite, and even the show's producer Nigel Lithgow admitted that the final count may have left a little to be desired due to the overwhelming number of votes flooding in. Two years later, Clay was voted the most loved reality star of all time in a TV Guide poll. No doubt many of those votes were cast by his obsessive fan base known as the Claymates. So in 2008, as he worked towards releasing his first album of all new material in five years, the pressure was on to live up to their expectations. If you don't have some amount of pressure, then you really don't, uh, then you don't work towards anything. If, I mean, you obviously, I think everybody works off of adrenaline to some extent, and if you don't have a little bit of it, then you're not going to get anywhere. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, you know, uh, I kind of always have said I'm, I'm, I kind of work off of a very strange curve in the fact that you know the first the first album and the first single and everything that happened first was so big off the back of Idol that um, it's kind of hard to top it. So he decided not to try and took a relaxed approach to On My Way Here. We're going to do what we're comfortable with. We're going to do what we like to do and we want to do and um, and make the album that we've wanted to make. Uh, and as a result, I think um, uh, I think. We've, we've put together something that we, that we all enjoy, everybody who is a part of it um, is proud of, uh, and it was easy to make because we didn't try to um, succumb to the pressures of, of this uh, entity or the radio or this, or you know, we just kind of did what we thought we were, we were ha we'd be happy with.